Awesome. Uh, um, welcome, everybody. Uh, want to acknowledge off the top that uh, this uh, TRC 57 speaker series session is coming to you from the beautiful territory of the Snanemoch people, the Halkamiknamkan people here on southern Vancouver Island. Um, my name is Ted Cadwallader. I'm District Director of Instruction for Indigenous Learning here in the Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools. Uh, again, welcome to our TRC 57 speaker series uh, here on the territory of the Coast Salish. We have uh, protocols to set the stage for when we have these gatherings. And so, as always in these, I will hand it over to my great friend Samkwatan uh, to set us off in a good way. Sarah for coming to join us today. Atanaquel, see it, Titel CM, E. Tot Mestimuch, E. Hum Mistuch, Eich Squalowan, E. Quam Quam Stuch, Tansali, Hata Ali Nishwalaqua, E. Hum Hawk wishes to CM Squalowan, Ata Eich CIs, Atanaquel, E. Hum Latlamethet, Ata Sathanst, E. the Schwalwalit, E. the Smithnamst, Heichka at the high hall eight squail, a ten a quail eat to muck squail. Dee whom stata can stoch at a kikalis e cocky mistimoch. Dee whom flachent as mistimoch at a elli nishwalaqua. Heichka to the CM Heichka. Oh, oh. 
Nice call, my brother. Uh, I always love when you create that space, invite our ancestors to join us and let our generation to come to hear these words as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just allows us to stop from our busy time when we come together like this and uh, be present and be here. I'd like to introduce everybody to my great friend, Stephanie Johnson, who's uh, also co-hosting this today. Um, Stephanie makes all of this happen. Uh, she uh, she's an amazing individual, and it's always a pleasure to do things like this with her. She's a, a tr tremendous uh, organizer, but uh, the strength of her relationships allow us to do amazing things like this. I also want to raise my uh, hands to Carrie Kilmartin and UBC Press, who's uh, they've been instrumental in our series. They uh, They've uh, allowed us to connect with uh, amazing people like our author uh, who joins us today. Um, Dr. Sarah Nichol joins us today. She's an award-winning author of the book that we're gonna talk about today, Assembling Unity, um, Indigenous Politics, Gender, and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Uh, she's a Kalmyk scholar. Um, and she's here to join with us today. Uh, to help us be better relatives on these treaty and unceded territories uh, through understanding our true history as a province and country. Uh, those of you who've joined us before know that our school district and, and truly our education system in British Columbia is on this journey of reconciliation and understanding and truth and trying to be better relatives on the territories that we serve and to those nations and families that we serve. And so uh, welcome, Sarah, and we're looking forward to spending the next hour with you. Thank you so much, and, and thank you all for that, that wonderful warm welcome and for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. I always say this with, I hope I can share my screen here. We'll see if we've got, I think that should be okay. Um, you know, this afternoon I am going to talk about my research on 20th century Indigenous political work in British Columbia, and particularly about the research I've done on this pan-tribal um, provincial union of BC Indian chiefs. And before I do that, I want to just introduce and, and locate myself a little bit. So my name is Sarah Nickel. I'm Kamloopsum or Kamloops Quetmuk, and my family hails from the interior of British Columbia. So from this, you know, beautiful rolling desert landscape pictured here in the top left with, uh, you know, sagebrush and wild horses and just all these wonderful things. Um, I spent most of my life in British Columbia, uh, first living in the very small town of Vale Mount, which is close to Mount Robson, um, in the farthest reaches of Shkonakulu or traditional Squam territory. I have also lived in Coast Salish territories on BC's southwest coast, in Treaty 7 territory in Lethbridge, Alberta, Treaty 6 territory in the Métis homelands, first in Saskatoon, and then now I'm in St. Albert, just north of Edmonton. And so we are, you know, all no doubt uh, currently situated on different Indigenous territories. I want to acknowledge that School District 68 operates within the ancestral and unceded territories of the Sna'as, Sna'amuk, and Sna'amus peoples. And I hold my hands up in gratitude for uh, welcoming me to this space and, and allowing me to be here. So as we, as we pause to you know, recognize the people of, of this and other territories, past, present, and future, I think, you know, it's important to reflect on processes of, of settler colonialism that frame our discussions um, and our lives. They are pervasive, they're ongoing, they benefit some of us while disadvantaging others. And, you know, I, as we consider how race and, and privilege impact our own lives, I think this is how we can work together towards, you know, true, genuine reconciliation. And I thank you for, for being here as part of that. Now, my work is really centered around unsettling how we think about Indigenous politics, and particularly as it relates to settler colonialism and stereotypes about gender and, you know, who can be political and under what circumstances. And so, 
you know, I come to this work as an educator dedicated to elevating marginalized voices and enabling students to see different types of people represented in the historical record. But I also come to this as an Indigenous person, just simply curious about my own past and um, that of my family and our roles in this. And so that is really where this current project began with, with family. So, whoops, I skipped one. So for me, this, this image captures so many elements of my work. It was taken in November 1969 on the grounds of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And it was taken to commemorate the newly formed Pan-Indigenous political organization, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Now, this is the image that sparked my curiosity in this era of political activism, where I was curious about Canada's leading and, and longstanding political organization. So that's still operating today. So it has a really lengthy history. This is an organization that just happened to get its start in my family's community. And in fact, my adopted grandfather, the late Chief Clarence Jules, was the official host of this event. So he was the, the chief of Kamloops at the time. Um, and so I was curious about the role that my family played in this very key political moment. I was also curious about what was represented in this image. So the political actions and motivations and histories of this large group of people that were representing a much larger group of people. So they were representing the almost 200 First Nations in British Columbia. So what drove them to attend this meeting? What did they hope to achieve? What were their backgrounds? What were their experiences like? This, these are the types of things I was interested in. But I was always also curious about what might be missing. So who was missing from this picture, this event? Whose voices weren't being heard? What might account for this? And I found very early on that when I looked at this picture and at this history, I was missing things. So for instance, when I looked at this image, my eyes you know, automatically focused on the middle and, and to the men. And I think in some ways that's natural because this is a chief's organization. My eyes went to the person that looked most chief-like. And because you know, at this time, most of the chiefs were men, it makes sense that I would look for the men in this picture. But it was through interviews with people, you know, some pictured here and some not, that I began to fill in the gaps of what you can't see in this picture, but also what I didn't see at first because I wasn't really looking. So for instance, women are present in this image, lots of them if you look closely, and this turned out to be a really main theme in my research, an unexpected theme actually, understanding the ways in which women took part in this organization even when their official political roles and responsibilities were quite limited. Children were also part of this story, but we don't see them here. So instead, as I learned in my interviews, they were running around in the background, as you can imagine children would. And, you know, I can really picture that. I can picture this, this building on the residential school grounds in Kamloops at the confluence of the North and South Thompson River, you know, under the shadows of Mount Peter and Mount Paul. And I can imagine you know, the children that were um, in and out of conversations, just as they would be, you know, in this meeting, just as they would be throughout the operation of the union and through the various political actions of their parents and their grandparents and their aunties and uncles, you know, some as chiefs and others as community members, as they're taking part in these, these actions, the children are ever present, but, but we don't see them. So in many ways, you know, it's through this image and the stories that BC Indigenous activists told me about this gathering, but also kind of the history surrounding it, that I was really able to access the messy narrative about Indigenous political action in this era and really the beautiful narrative that I think I've, I've discovered. So, you know, what is Indigenous politics really and how did it fit into uh, the history of the Union? So to understand this, I think, um, you know, I really had to first confront my own misconceptions of what I thought Indigenous politics was. And that meant moving past dueling stereotypes that it was either radical action, you know, violence and protest, or it was bureaucratic responses to settler policy. And there was actually very little in between. And the union itself seemed to really fit in that latter category. And so I, I really accepted that until I began to see evidence that, that challenged my thinking. Um, 
And so I think that my initial understanding of politics as one of two stereotypes is actually quite normal. Um, and so I just want to take a moment to unpack what that might look like. And, you know, many of us will be familiar with the images that, that I'm going to show here, um, images of so-called Indigenous militancy in the 20th century that tended to splash the pages of the mainstream media. You know, images like this one here of Chipetan, also known as the Gustafson Lake standoff in 1995, British Columbia, which saw Scotland Sundancers come up against first a settler landowner and then the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, complete with tactical assault teams and armored personnel carriers over access to sacred ceremonial space. This happened at a place that people have been holding ceremonies for thousands of years without incident until settler colonial land processes made it seem like it was people that were intruding on settler lands rather than the other way around. Or this famous image that I'm sure you're all familiar with of the police and military siege of Kanasataki known to many of us as the Oka crisis in 1990. This saw Quebec provincial police forces and the Canadian army stage a 78 day siege to challenge Kanikahaga land defenders over a centuries old land claim. Maybe a little bit less well known but certainly something that came up in my initial research was this image, uh, of quite a chilling image, I would say, of, of land defenders at the armed blockade at Sukdaus, otherwise known as Cache Creek in 1974. Here we see guns aimed at what turns out to be a Vancouver Sun reporter who's, who's covering the story. Um, and this event saw protesters block the highway to raise awareness over a lack of reserve housing. So something that is very common um, and, and obviously, you know, something that everybody should be entitled to is, is good housing. Later that summer on the other side of the country, we have the occupation of Anisinaabe Park in Ontario. This saw members of the Ojibwe Warrior Society, members of the American Indian Movement on both sides of the border, um, as well as others that, that are here occupying this park to dispute living conditions and uh, lack of access to land and particularly ancestral uh, lands. So these events, I think, which made headline news and focused only, you know, not only on militancy, but also tended to feature Indigenous men prominently as the militants, um, became really well known to Canadians. And these are partial images, of course. So these, these images really erase the complexity of, of who's participating in these actions and what drove them to do so. So, you know, other than the, the last image here, we don't see women, um, we don't see young people, but of course, these people are, are ever present at these events. And of course, events never start like this. They don't start with violence. They start with lots of other um, efforts to, to have issues resolved, sometimes over generations. We don't see that in these images. So, you know, I think this, this these images that, that really pervade our understanding of Indigenous politics sort of shape and, and um, reinforce the idea that Indigenous politics is stereotypically violent. Now on the other side of things, the less explosive, more traditionally political, we have bureaucratic responses to policies like Canada's statement of the Government of Canada on Indian policy, known rather unfortunately, but probably quite accurately as the white paper. Now, this is one of the most well-known moments of 20th century Indigenous politics. And for me, I realized that, you know, over time it had become all synonymous with the modern Indigenous rights movement. It's often credited with the creation of this movement because of the unprecedented responses it got. And because in the case of my own research, it was said to lead directly to the creation of the union. Now the policy itself was the brainchild of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and then Minister of Indian Affairs Jean Chrétien. And it was really proposing to end the legal difference between First Nations people and, and other Canadians. It was this difference, they argued, that was responsible for all of First Nations people's troubles. So in short, the white paper was really a driven by this desire for legal equality between citizens. So in order to achieve that, the proposal was to get rid of the Indian Act, which is a, that conglomerate of, of sort of outdated patriarchal policies dictating the lives of First Nations people and the treaties in order to achieve this. And so this is, you know, for, for people like uh, uh, Trudeau the Elder, you know, it's really about not wanting Canadian citizens to have different rights from each other. Everybody should have the same rights. No one should have special rights. So he's thinking of First Nations people here. He's also thinking of French Canadian language rights at the same time. 
This sounds like obviously a, a wonderful ideal. Um, everyone is equal, hurrah. But of course it ignores the fact that cultural class, gender and racial differences have always existed and simply wishing they didn't, trying to legislate them out of existence just doesn't make them go away. So this is the principle that Trudeau and his cabinet acted upon, a noble wish perhaps, but ultimately diluted. Trudeau and Chrétien were also operating on really misguided information about what these policies and the legal principles um, accomplished and, and sort of what the basis of them were. So where did these policies come from and what were they trying to accomplish? They, they really misunderstood this. So for Chrétien, for instance, he proved in House of Commons debates that he actually didn't understand what the treaties were. So he interpreted them as agreements that could be dissolved by allocating, in his words, so much twine and so much gunpowder. So these were not the sacred covenants that Indigenous peoples and the original signatories of these agreements understood them to be. Instead, he saw them really as contracts that could be satisfied by, by simple material exchanges, one-time material exchanges. And though First Nations people had never been entirely pleased with existing Indian policy and unfulfilled treaty promises and the overall very messy history of Indigenous settler relationships, they absolutely balked at the federal government's plan to unilaterally abolish these structures, insisting that this went against Indigenous leaders' feedback on current Indian policy. And this was feedback that the federal government actually sought out. So they, you know, requested this information through months-long consultations with Indigenous leaders Indigenous leaders, you know, spent lots of time talking about current Indian policy and thinking of ways that they could productively move forward. And at the end of the day, the federal government ignored all these suggestions and just went forward with their own, own beliefs about what was best. So unsurprisingly, when this policy is released, Indigenous leaders across Canada call for its immediate retraction. And they moved really quickly to coordinate their responses. So in less than 24 hours after the white paper uh, is, is released, the policy is released, the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood released a scathing press release that criticized both the process and the outcome of the policy proposal. And in the days and weeks and months that followed, political organizations across Canada, including the newly formed union, issued position papers and political manifestos. Now it's because of these coordinated responses that really put Indigenous organizations on the map that we can hardly speak of the 20th century and Indigenous politics without referencing the white paper. But often these discussions focus on the policy as a watershed moment, characterizing it really as the, the moment that changed everything for Indigenous politics. You know, if you ask people what they know about Indigenous political history in this time period, most people are going to know about the white paper. But is this emphasis on the white paper as a turning point or as the marker of the modern Indigenous rights movement entirely justified? I don't think so. I, I don't dispute its, its overall importance, but I think it has been problematically taken up in ways that overemphasize state policy as a driving force of activism. And that I think erases, or at the very least minimizes pre-1969 political work, casting it as something else entirely, something that we don't have to think about. This really, I think, has overshadowed the fact that in decades before this policy is released, Indigenous people across BC, but also Canada, of course, were already working towards pan-Indigenous unity with some really robust political organizations that predated the white paper. And then those organizations that followed, like the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, had longer and really more complex paths than, uh, that predated this political document that, that we need to take into account, I think. So really, you know, crediting the white paper for enabling successful pan-Indigenous unity gives uneven recognition to settler colonial policy over top of generations of Indigenous political work. Um, and that's something that I, I, I want to dispute a little bit. Now, I think ultimately both these types of moments, the radical and explosive, the conservative and bureaucratic minded are united in their ability to really undermine or muddle our understanding of what Indigenous politics is what its impacts have been, who's been involved, and more importantly, I guess, where this all fits in terms of Canadian history and how we understand it. So these stereotypes you know, that they perpetuate really obscure some of the realities of politics that trend across these extremes. <laughs> 
And this really matters for me as an academic and as an educator because I want students in my classes to know that Indigenous political histories are robust and longstanding, that they're not just tied up in one policy that scarcely lasted two years. It gets retracted in 1971. I want Indigenous students to know that it wasn't just their male ancestors that are fighting for change, but also their grannies and their aunties. I want students who are often confronted with images of radicalism and militancy as the only example of politics they see to understand that politics took all sorts of forms and that militancy is only one part of the picture and it's complicated on its own. And this to me helps to combat the all too common belief that Indigenous politics isn't legitimate. It's not real politics, not really. It's, it's something else entirely. And I think I can accomplish this by simply talking about political action differently. So my research really takes this on by looking at this 1969 creation of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, as well as how it operated into the early 1980s. That's as far as I go in my research. I don't look to present day. Um, and you know, I know what you're thinking. At first glance, the union appears to be totally bureaucratic, male-dominated organization that was created directly in response to the white paper. And so actually seems to confirm the narrative that I'm trying to challenge. So I hear that it's easy to understand why. Um, its organis organizational structure was traditionally bureaucratic. It wasn't radical. There were very few female chiefs at the time. So the organization was dominated by men for a good part of its history. And the timing of the union's creation in November 1969, four months after the white paper, really seems to confirm this direct causality. I know this doesn't look good for me. But when we look closely, we can see the strong political backbone that the UBCIC rested upon, which included several efforts towards unity before 1969 to solve the BC land claim and, and seek better conditions for First Nations people. We see women's participation in these efforts. We see protests and direct action alongside meetings with Robert's Rules of Order. And most importantly, we see intense political negotiating by all community members to ensure the union's creation and longevity. Everybody is taking part in these discussions, even though they might not have formal roles in that. So the role of Indigenous women in the creation of the Union wasn't immediately apparent. And in fact, scholars argued that at the beginning of 1969, BC was one of the only provinces without a province-wide Indigenous organization. And that is true if you don't count Indigenous women who had not one, but two province-wide organizations at the time. And by provincial, I mean broadly representative across the province. Uh, there were plenty of regional and tribally based uh, women's organizations too, uh, but their breadth was limited. But there were two province-wide representative organizations. So this showed me quite early on how pervasive gendered assumptions about politics were. Women's activities don't count as politics. BC's two organizations, the British Columbia Indian Homemakers Association and the BC Native Women's Society were formally created in 1968, but they operated prior to that informally. And in fact, when they were newly formed uh, in that formal independent sense, um, they, they were formed out of existing organizations, existing clubs that, that had been operating, you know, for years in some cases, in, for decades in other cases, that were, you know, these clubs were working to help improve Indigenous lives. And so that's what these clubs were built out of, these, these early uh, local organizations. So some of the earliest Indigenous organizations in, in BC for women were the Indian Homemakers Clubs. Now, these were modeled after the Settler Women's Homemaking Institutes, which were popular across Canada as early as 1897 um, in Ontario, and then spread west by the early 1900s. It was Thomas Robertson, the inspector of Indian agencies, who introduced the idea of extending these settler homemakers clubs to surrounding reserve communities in Saskatchewan. And he did this because he saw a potential for greater assimilation through the domestic training of women. So in this sense, Indigenous women would be aided through the clubs to be more um, effective housewives and mothers in the settler understanding of things. They could improve living conditions on reserve, and they could become, in the words of Indian Affairs, happier and more useful citizens, not counting the fact that they weren't actually citizens at the time. 
1937, the country's first Indian Homemakers Club was established at the Red Pheasant Reserve, which is just northwest of Saskatoon, where women started to receive instruction on sewing and cooking and childcare practices, food preservation techniques, and gardening like we see here uh, two years later at the Cote Reserve. This management of Indigenous domestic lives and Indigenous motherhood implied that women were both the problem and the solution to poor reserve conditions and Indigenous people's poor social status. And of course, this conveniently relieves Indian affairs in the Canadian state of its own role in this, which is often, you know, um, codified in policy. Despite this, Indigenous women were dedicated to their communities and their families, and they were really keen to take part in these clubs, and so they did quite readily. The clubs expanded really quickly across the country. In 1940, just three years after Red Pheasants Club was, was established, clubs are active in 14 Saskatchewan Reserve communities. And by the end of the 1940s, we see that the clubs have, have spread to British Columbia. The first club, as far as I can tell, in BC was the Paul Creek Homemakers Club, and that was started in, in 1949 uh, by the same woman who ends up uh, initiating the BC Native Women's Society, Mildred Gobertson. By October 1955, there are 14 active homemakers clubs in BC, and, and you can see in these images here, um, you know, the maps that show March 1955 to October 1955, we go from eight clubs to 14 in just a few months. Um, and this rapid growth is, is really common. Um, these clubs are, are exceptionally popular and they grow in size. We have 14 active clubs in October 1955, but lots are actually acting unofficially. So they're not yet part of the official club network that's created in, in 1951. They're just operating on their own. Um, and so we see a lot that join the official club network and then a lot that just operate outside of it as well. Now, Indigenous women use these clubs to learn some of the domestic skills or, or improve on some of the domestic skills that I've just mentioned, but they also provided social activities and important services to their communities. So they hosted things like children's parties and bridal and baby showers and funerals. They also raised money for chief's travel uniforms for sports teams, uh, repairs to houses and, and local churches. Essentially, wherever there was a need, the homemakers clubs were there and they were flexible and they were just doing whatever they could. Now, their fundraising really consisted of, um, you know, hosting suppers and bingos and rummage and bake sales, since they received little, if any, financial support from the Department of Indian Affairs that created these clubs. So they were really on their own in terms of funding their own activities. Sewing work in particular played an important role in these early club activities where members were teaching each other to repair and remodel donated clothing as well as to make new clothing and linens either for sale to raise money or for their own personal use. And the centrality of sewing is not a coincidence. Indian Affairs actually very much pushes this idea as a club activity by promising a sewing machine and $50 worth of material to any new club that joins. And by this they meant they would approve the use of band funds to pay for these things, not that they actually provided them, though, though the language they use in the records really does suggest that they're, they're handing out money. Now, what I found is that between the 1940s and late 1960s, sewing serves a really broad range of social welfare and economic and cultural goals, some of which really did fit into Indian Affairs mandate to redirect Indigenous women's domestic training to align with settler ideals, others that really emerged from women's own social and political needs, including their desire to better, um, to better their communities and, and to do that through these activities. By the 1960s, homemakers clubs and other Indigenous women's clubs in BC are expanding dramatically and begin to take on more, more overt forms of political activity, such as lobbying to officials in Indian affairs and health and welfare for better schools and houses and access to health care, um, noting that all the domestic work and elbow grease in the world is not going to fix the bigger structural problems that are hampering their communities. The women are asking, you know, how can we ensure healthy and sanitary homes and families when we don't have access to running water or electricity? How can we prepare children to be responsible citizens using the department's language if they lacked access to adequate schools and if the curriculum they're exposed to is full of harmful stereotypes? <laughs> 
Unsurprisingly, Indian Affairs is concerned with women's new political focus and it, it immediately withdraws its limited financial but also moral support, um, claiming that the women are becoming too much of a pressure group. The homemakers in turn take this opportunity to seek their independence and they create a new political organization that they call the BC Indian Homemakers Association. And it's you know, similar in name and, and lots of the clubs that pre-exist are amalgamated into this, but it really has a distinctly political bent at this time. They have the freedom to, to pursue political mandates. Now, similar political developments are happening with the other BC women's clubs. That same year saw the creation of the Native Women's Society. And this is a provincial women's council that's amalgamating all the groups that really exist outside the homemakers structure. So the homemakers were very reserve based, but there were other clubs that incorporated status and non-status women, reserve and, and off reserve, Métis out of province, and those groups amalgamated under the BC Native Women's Society. As provincial spokeswomen and lobbyists, these two groups are, begin to really push the government for clarity and policies that affect their communities. They criticize service inequalities. They call for new schools to be built. They call for equal funding for Indigenous children in foster care and, and things like this. So they have very limited formal political capital, but they become very astute activists and, and they accomplish a lot through these channels. So, through this brief history, I think it's really clear that Indigenous women were politically active in their own ways. They also had experience with pan-tribal organization. So in addition to having their own organizations, they are also instrumental in creating the union in November 1969. As the only provincial organizations at this time, they were involved in the initial call for the chief's organization and the call for that original conference. They helped fundraise to support the cost of that conference through a series of moccasin walks from, from the Fraser Valley to Vancouver, as well as other efforts that they've proven they're pretty good at. They're good at fundraising to, to support their own activities and so they transfer this over to the creation of the union. Like the male leadership at the time, women's organizations saw real value in pan-Indigenous unity as a way to address the land question and the conditions facing Indigenous people, despite their exclusion from official membership positions in this organization. So the organization was made to be uh, um, made up to be elected band chiefs and counselors as voting members. And from that group of people, we have a 15 member executive council that gets that gets elected. In 1969, there are no official or legal barriers preventing women from holding these positions, but that had only changed in 1951. And so the result is that this longstanding ban preventing women from, from running for office in banned politics um, really takes hold in Indigenous communities. And, and the impacts of this political exclusion last for a really long time, arguably even to today. So we just don't have very many female chiefs and counselors at this time that would gain membership as, as voting members members in this organization. But quite simply, the conference that created the union wouldn't have happened without the financial support, the political buy-in, and the labor of the, you know, the only provincial organizations at this time. So women were involved in and around the union in different ways. Once the conference was scheduled, they helped organize it and execute it through administrative roles and domestic tasks and all these other often underappreciated but necessary political roles. And through its operation, Indigenous women in their organizations, but also in other ways, continued to be involved in the union. They worked as staff members in the land claims office and as field workers. They worked on the front lines in protest. Um, they, they were there present in meetings. But because the women's organizations didn't have a voice at the table in the union through an official vote until 1977, their activities in their own organizations remained really critical as channels for them to pursue their goals and to put their um, political mandates on the agenda of the union. So they really still needed their organizations. Now, they were also there to, to push back against decisions that were made by the chiefs, particularly those that they felt put women and children in harm's way. So this was the case in when the union in 1975 decides to reject all forms of federal funding and, and other government funding in a very widespread, albeit misguided, attempt at Indigenous sovereignty. Um, women were very much against this as it harmed unduly harmed women and children. 
When it looked, when the union looked to solidify indigenous rights in the constitution and insisted on defining its own membership in ways that failed to account for women's status loss in the Indian Act, women also weren't too happy and pushed back against that. So they were ever present in these conversations pushing back. They were vocal, they were active in the limited channels available to them. Now, women's organizations weren't the only ones to predate the union or to become involved in its creation. So pan-Indigenous alliances are not new, and BC has long histories of political cooperation. So with limited histories of treaty making, Indigenous peoples historically focused on pressuring federal and provincial governments on the BC land question. In the 19th century, organizations were really about pursuing title and treaties and self-government, and in large part, the groups that were politically active in this time period around the late 1880s were heavily reliant on support from outsiders like missionaries, ethnologists, and lawyers to help leaders navigate the Canadian legal and political system. This period saw plenty of united political advocacy like chiefs delegations to Victoria and Ottawa and England to assert Indigenous land rights. Now here, there was lots of regional unity amongst interior nations, Coast Salish people, and communities along the Northwest Coast. And these early efforts are important for a number of reasons, but certainly demonstrate unequivocally that Indigenous people knew their rights and understood that there was real strength in numbers to pursue recognition of those rights. They also show how momentum built towards the political activities of the 1950s and 1960s, and that history is really important. In the first decade of the 20th century, you know, further pan-tribal delegations are traveling to Europe to insist on past promises made by the Crown be honored. In 1909, in what legal scholar Hamer Foster fittingly, I think, describes as a turning point in early Indigenous rights, is a petition by Cowichan chiefs drafted by settler allies that's sent to the colonial office in London. That same year, we have a delegation of interior chiefs that travel to London to meet Prime Minister Laurier. And when they return, they begin to align themselves beyond their regional affiliations to encompass um, other groups of people and, and other organizations that, that have developed at this time. And so what we see is this era is the creation of the Pan-Tribal Indian Rights Association, followed closely by the unification of interior nations under the interior tribes of British Columbia. So really uniting in bigger amalgamations. For many communities, this is the first time they're really involved in some of these widespread pan-Indigenous political cooperation, and this really shifts the landscape. Between 1909 and 1911, there are numerous nations across the province, including the Couch and Nishka, Talta and Lilouette, and groups of interior nations that make presentations and forward petitions and send delegations to outline their discontent with government and to reiterate their desire to settle the land claim. So this is constant in this era. And while there are similar setbacks, including Premier McBride's flat out rejection of the land claim issue in that year, uh, things are reaching an important tipping point by this time. It's this you know, continued pressure and then a shift in federal politics with the election of Robert Borden's conservatives that lead to the creation of the Royal Commission on Indian Affairs in the province of British Columbia, also known as the McKenna McBride Commission. Between 1913 and 1916, commissioners visit reserves across British Columbia to inspect the land base and to hold public hearings on reserve land issues. Now, this is a significant step for the feds, but agents don't envision this commission as a way to address the land question broadly. Really, they're, they're focused on reserve allotments and whether they're appropriate, not on land title. But community members, Indigenous people see their moment. And so they, in these hearings, speak freely, consistently, vocally, loudly about all the concerns that they have, not just with reserve land, but with title and resource rights and with access to education and health care and the slow pace of government action. And they really deftly use these spaces for their own political agendas, forcing the commissioners to listen. And, you know, much to the commissioner's surprise, I think. Indigenous leaders 
you know, don't really have high hopes for the result of this commission, bracing themselves for a disappointing uh, final report, which they receive, the active and disparate BC Indigenous organizations decide to unite. And in 1916, we have the, the unification of 16 nations under the allied tribes of British Columbia. Now, this new organization allows multiple groups to come together in ways that had never happened before. And this is an really unprecedented moment and a real boon for the, the movement. It would be short-lived. Um, in 1927, the federal government makes a very timely, very strategic amendment to the Indian Act that makes it illegal for Indigenous people to hire, hire lawyers to pursue the land claim. This fundamentally undercuts the base of Indigenous political organizing, and as a response, the Allied tribe formally disbands. And, and this really effectively ends the province's best shot at a provincial organization at this time. But hope is not lost. This isn't the end. This is the start of a different brand of organizing. We see some more subversive organizing at this time. So Indigenous activists continue to pursue unity as well as Indigenous land and resource rights. Sometimes they act a little bit clandestinely in associations like the Native Brotherhood of British Columbia, which is a fishing organization created in 1931, right at the height of you know, this, this 1927 amendment that doesn't get uh, repealed until 1951. It's a fishing organization about fishing rights, but it on the side also has a little bit of a lean towards land claims activism that they just keep on the down low. It frames itself really interestingly at points. I heard from one activist that at one point it framed itself as a religious organization, holding its meetings in churches, singing hymns, holding political papers hidden in Bibles in case an Indian agent has happened to walk by. And I think this really shows this um, flexibility um, and persistence of Indigenous activism, as well as knowing how to work the system. Other organizations like the Aboriginal Rights Committee, the Nishka Land Committee, they continue their work throughout this time period, but very carefully in the 1940s and 1950s. And then when legal obstacles to organizing are removed in 1951, Indigenous people continue their efforts out in the open, building and amalgamating and revising associations to work towards this ultimate goal of provincial unity. And this is very clear that this is what they're working towards. In 1966, two years before consultations about the white paper began, a gathering at Musqueam brought representatives from all the disparate pan-Indigenous political organizations together, and it ended with the creation of the Confederation of Native Indians of British Columbia. Arguably the closest that they had come to true provincial unity by this point, just so close. This new association is still not quite right because mem uh, members aren't really clear how membership is going to work, as well as what decision making powers they have. So this organization is based on individual memberships. So how do you transition any important decisions you make into practice if you have norm no formal political capital to make those changes? So what becomes clear is that they need a chief's organization. And in 1969, this is what they get. So by the time the white paper comes around, Indigenous people in BC had tons of political experience and they were well poised to create a pan-Indigenous political organization. Now, I'm not saying that the activities of the late 1880s and 1960s are the same. I'm not saying that we don't have distinct phases of political organization, but rather if we look at these early events and we understand the evolution of the broader movement, and we see how even in the early 60s and then up until 66, that long before the white paper communities had really similar strong goals of provincial unity. And when we look at it that way, the white paper is important, but a little bit less important. It's, it doesn't dominate. And I think this is really clear, especially with that 1966 creation of the Confederation, that that is not about the white paper at this point. So coming full circle back to the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, which gained recognition as the first provincial organization, um, unlike the women's organization had broadly based decision-making powers and in the coming years had strong budget lines and paid positions. This can tell us a lot about how indigenous politics operates. In understanding the long political and gendered history of its making, we can see that men's experiences are, of course, not universal representations, and that Indigenous political paths are really long. 
And as the union grows its political legs in the 1970s and 1980s, I found that women and grassroots constituents who continued to really have little formal political power pushed the union in a lot of ways. They pushed it to democratize, democratize its membership. They pushed it to get involved in direct action responses like occupations and blockades. And you know, through these ever evolving political activities, which were also not always just local, but connected to movements like the American Indian Movement and connected to movements like global decolonization. These enable us to see how indigenous politics in BC grew and changed over time as activists achieved and maintained political unity because of, but sometimes in spite of this chief's organization. And it's those conversations, it's those political strategies that demonstrate, in my mind, the richness of Indigenous political histories that are so much more than many of us assume them to be. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing that story, that narrative. Uh, a few things, of course, uh, stand out from my mind. One of the things that we were taught by one of our guests earlier, Joanne Archibald, is that uh, the story uh, rings a lesson for the people who are listening to it in a different way. So the things, of course, that fall into my mind um, are going to be different. So, And I hope that's true for all the people who see this going forward. Um, one thing that stands out in there was uh, the things you told us at the very beginning uh, that uh, tweaked for you. you. You, This photo made you curious. And I don't know when you saw this photo, but it's certainly taken you on a long personal academic journey uh, <laughs> through, <laughs> through many different paths. Uh, so I just highlighted, be curious. And I think that would be a, a lesson and a teaching going forward when you see things like the the uh, Gustafson Lake uh, standoff or what we saw as Oka, be curious about what's behind that because it didn't just hit a flashpoint then. Yeah. Um, so um, I also, I'm very pleased that uh, you bring Indigenous women uh, forward and place them in a front, in a, in a front standing place within your book, Assembling Unity, because that's been my experience along the way too, is it's a different style of politics, mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly is uh, deep and influential within communities and, and has been deep and influential forever in our communities here in BC. And the, and the last thing that stands out for me is that flag, because I, I have one of those. Because uh, as a young fellow, I was a fisherman on this coast. Oh, and so I, I still have one of those flags at my house. Uh, so, but I didn't, again, didn't realize its history and how it fit into this larger context and story of uh, the pan political movements for Indigenous people in British Columbia. That's wonderful. I mean, it's all the untold stories, right? That you think you maybe have an understanding of something and then somebody says something. And I remember talking to Delbert Guerin and he, when he told me about the this, you know, religious past of the, mm -hmm. the Native Brotherhood. And I thought, wait a minute, what? I've never heard that before. And it's these little, these little clues that you get that really shift your thinking and, and yeah, this this project for me was definitely an a, an explosion of understanding what politics was, and then and then realizing how much more work there is to be done. And so, you know, really, my next project is all about Indigenous women's politics in the West because there were just so many things I couldn't shove in that book. Um, mm -hmm. So there, yeah, so many stories to be told. That's amazing. Well, thank you for joining us. I know that uh, the many teachers who are watching this and, and educators across this country uh, are going to make great use of this in their classrooms to teach about critical thinking, to teach about honoring that history and the continual work of Indigenous people, particularly in British Columbia, British Columbia to establish maybe a final solution to the land claims and the return of the lands that they've had since time immemorial. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This was really enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks everybody else for joining us too.